So starting with Francis Chung at the end, Francis is a senior executive at CJ. I had the privilege of getting to know him working together on a film called Snowpiercer and he now heads up international for CJ in terms of the development and production. As Daniel mentioned on the earlier seminar, we're talking about multicultural films, co-productions, remakes, everything. Rob Ree, to his right, is head of international business development for Tencent Pictures. Obviously, Tencent has been a big force in changing the landscape in China and in their cross-border transactions with the US. Doug Montgomery has double duty. He's a vice president at Warner Brothers Home Entertainment and has also been going back and forth among many cities in the world, including Tokyo, London, but apparently it sometimes brings him to Arkansas as well, and is doing double duty as a chairman of the Japan America Society of Southern California. Yoshiko Fukuda is a manager of production and development for Toho International which is a subsidiary of Studio Toho and behind the beloved franchise Godzilla and many of the monster movies that I grew up with, need we say more. Yasu Katami, Vice President of Amuse Group USA, which is a US subsidiary of the Japanese company Amuse Inc. And Amuse USA launched an interesting program called J Creation, a first look showcase at content matching so bridging the gap between Japanese rights holders and US filmmakers. Last but not least, another gentleman that I have the pleasure of working with, Daljit DJ Parmar, who is the CEO of Extraordinary Entertainment and who came up with the brilliant idea of forming a Beijing-based company that is actually not financed by Chinese money and that produces both local language films and his directing partner uh, with Rennie Harlan and so they're both producing and developing films for the Chinese marketplace as well as internationally. So all more than well qualified to speak about how IP crosses borders in its many forms and gets evolved and morphed into other things. So a, group, uh, a question just to the group initially, obviously each of your companies and each of you have been involved in either acquiring or licensing properties for adaptation. So in what arena have you encountered your biggest challenges? Do they come out of the creative arena, the business arena, the deal-making portion? Where have you encountered your biggest challenges? Well, I think I speak for the group by saying all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can jump into maybe one of those points. Uh, uh, you know, we closed the uh, remake rights for Rambo, which is obviously one of the most iconic titles in Hollywood. Um, our goal is obviously to do a local adaptation for the Indian market. So Indian story, uh, Indian star, Indian director, Indian setting. And uh, when we closed the deal, um, it took us one year to negotiate the rights. Uh, that process included uh, us having to pitch our take and our vision for the remake to the rights holders. And then more importantly, it took another year just to clear the chain of title. So. I don't think what most people realize is that all these iconic franchises like Rambo and through all the sequels, there have been so many different uh, elements of the chain of title that are so complicating from studios going bankrupt, uh, different talent deals, uh, passive payments, third party obligations. So actually a very challenging part of uh, the first process of making a remake happen is the chain of title. Mm. Yeah, Yasu, we were talking about that actually before the panel, some of the challenges that happen between the manga creators who create a lot of the great iconic properties in Japan and trying to do deals either with U.S. studios or indies. Mm -hmm. um, so um, like, you know, Steve introduced our company, you know, we launched uh, the project that's called J-Creation. Mm -hmm. Like we are collecting the old IPs, Japanese IP from the variety of the entertainment group, like from publishing company, studios, and networks. And, and we introduce those IPs to the Hollywood producers so that you know, they can you know, do the remake or adaptation based on the Japanese IP. So it's not, you know, um, I'm not talking about the, all the published companies like this, but you know, they, sometimes they have some difficulty you know, working with a, like American studio, and, and American studio working with Japanese publishing companies because you know, um, 
they want to they wanna get some like a very popular title from the you know, author, original creator of the, the manga creators. But all the time, you know, the publishing company in the, between those, the studio and the creators, they have a different agenda. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what kind of agenda you know, that publishing company has, because ultimately, the Japanese publishing company's job, you know, task is to sell the book, to sell the manga. So how making the you know, motion picture in the US it's gonna be beneficial to their business. If you know the formula, how you can solve that problem, then maybe you have a high chance to get the rights from the original creator or slash publishing companies. Just to jump in on that, you know, yeah. once you get past the first two stages, then how do you break through? It's such a saturated IP-based content market today. Mm -hmm. So to get the audience attention, it has to be distinct. And so that's the additional challenge beyond the first two. Mm -hmm. Well, for, further to that, I mean, when you're remaking a, such an iconic IP, I mean, there's so much pressure to actually develop it so it's adapted for the local market in a unique yeah. way that makes sense. So that's a, a huge challenge on top of everything else. Yeah, Yoshiko, you obviously have experience with one of the most iconic characters. So is that a great deal of pressure? Is that harder to do than a lesser known property? So I, I think it does depend on the property, but I, basically the studio partners here would obviously want all the rights because they do not want something coming out from Japan, uh, you know, because it'll cannibalize the market if they're looking for a global market. So I do understand, but if it's an iconic property that already has a franchise ongoing, it is very hard for the rights owners to let that go. They really would like to retain the rights, as was the case of, for Godzilla as well. It's, it's just we had a global sort of marketplace already that Toho was exploiting. We couldn't just let that go, and so we, we really have to find a way to agree to have that ongoing, something still continue for the rights owners, to have the ability for them to exploit, at the, but at the same time, have it completely separate from what the studios are doing. And it is a great, big challenge for, for the studios or the producing partners to understand. And, and so Toho had to really you know, show a partnership of sort to say, we will continue exploiting it, but we will do it in a planned way so that there's a global sort of a continuing you know, presence in the market of Godzilla. So we did come out with a um, Netflix anime series after the Legendary's um, 2014 movie came out. And then of course, um, there was a Japanese version of the Godzilla that came out. So it's, I, I realize it's a very difficult thing. It depends on the IP, but that I think there are ways to work it out. It's still challenging. Yeah, Doug, one of your responsibilities is leading retail category management. So what do you do when you acquire a property that has an existing merchandising base, for example? And now you've got an issue where there's existing merchandise, existing ancillary rights exploitation, but you're going to be investing a huge amount in a new, fe a new feature film. So anyway, listen to everybody here, I, I feel the pressure because you're taking this property and it all comes sitting here because you've got to sell it. <laughs> oh, and that, that's, that's not an easy thing. But, you know, I think our company, Warner, we do a, a very good job and we, you know, really respect the, the, the property and, and the franchises. We absolutely understand mm -hmm. the, the value of a brand. If you see what, you know, we have done with whether it's Batman or Harry Potter, but even with, you know, Godzilla yes. or Pikachu. I mean, we, we, we try to stay true to the brand with the, the adaptation. Mm -hmm. As far as the marketplace goes, that, that's an interesting question because you know, people will ask me sometimes, what do you do? And I'll say, well, you know, in entertainment, there's two parts, people who make it and people who sell it. Oh, how hard is it to sell? Well, you know, maybe a little harder than you think because if they make something good, it's easy to sell. But you know, on the other hand, how to break through in, in a crowded marketplace, um, you know, essentially what we're trying to do is get our product on the homepage, on the shelf, wherever it is, and get another iconic brand off. Because it's not like we're competing against dead air. We're competing against X-Men. We're competing against, you know, strong properties from, from mm -hmm. Disney. So specifically what we do, and, and Warner is quite famous for this, is we, we do a very data-based, fact-based approach to what we believe, you know, market potential of something would be. And that's kind of our, our, our group's um, raison d'etre. Got it. 
And Francis, are you taking a similar approach? I mean, obviously CJ has a library of mm -hmm. great Korean titles. So what kind of approach are you taking to being able to exploit those titles in other markets? I mean, we've been around for, we've been in the U.S. for about 12 years now. And we started as much, as you know, as everybody here, we started selling remakes to studios. And Korean people, I can speak on behalf of all the Korean people here, we aren't patient people. And <laughs> uh, everything needs to move really quickly. But of the seven or eight titles that we sold over the past 10 or 12 years, none of them had, had gotten released. And it was because of the chain of title re issues or the creative issues or restructuring a studio. So a few years back, starting 2016, we started taking a more active role in our remakes. So we now develop finance development, finance production. Um, at times we package it and we take it to the studios so that we can have more control over the quality as well as the timeline. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of the biggest change that we've had over the past few years. Let's talk a little bit, let's depart a little bit from the deal-making side of it and the chain of title problems. Talk about the creative side. I mean, when you think about DJ coming back to you, Rambo, and repurposing that f chiefly for the Indian marketplace, what happens from a linguistic standpoint? What happens from a cultural standpoint as you try to translate that? So, um... The first two years I've already spoke about, let's talk about the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you have such an iconic title like Rambo, which is very unique compared to some of these other titles because it's essentially based on Stallone. And I think that every action star in India grew up watching these movies and idolized Stallone. So you have a huge barrier in terms of, you know, how do you adapt this in a way that not only works for the market, um, but also will interest a big Indian star to star in this film. So, uh, you know, it takes a lot of development. Um, we spent two years developing the script with our director and writers uh, to really nail uh, an adaptation that we felt um, was fresh, it was organic, and it really made sense for the Indian market. And it was a story that um, would really excite Indian actors. So it's a, it's a really involved process. But were they intimidated? I mean, was it hard to find the star because they were intimidated taking on that role? Um, I can't officially say, but uh, <laughs> let's just say it took another year to get the actor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, these uh, major Indian action stars, uh, they look up to Stallone. So their fear would be um, making a poor remake and, you know, kind of really... Uh, not impressing Stallone, their mentor, the guy they looked up to their entire life. So that's definitely a major challenge with something so specific of an IP like Rambo. That makes sense. What about other things that happen? For example, Rob, what about budgetary constraints? Obviously, mm -hmm. making a film in China is going to have one budget, making it in the U.S., and particularly for a global yeah. audience, completely different budget. So translating things are going to have to take financial consideration. Yeah, no, that's a, a, a great point. And you know, when we look at you know, Chinese IP, um, some of the top IPs, if it's a comic, could have hundreds of millions of reads, sometimes billions. Uh, but when we look at telling that story internationally, people don't know what that property is. So we have to treat it maybe as an original. You know, what is that core story idea or element that could connect with the international audience, but also, you know, budget-wise, what is a sensible budget range that that story should be told uh, so that it makes sense also economically. Um, and this is, again, where we really do rely on our partners to come together to find that plan both creatively and on the business side to make it um, work in the marketplace. You know, this is a marketplace right now that is going through a lot of changes, and I think that you have to be very mindful of not just the creative part of the project, but how it fits into the marketplace from a business perspective. I could jump in on that one, actually. Um, <clears throat> one thing that uh, I've kind of got a lot of experience in is looking through chains of title, and one of the major challenges, at least for the Indian market, is that um, 
traditionally all Hollywood movies have certain passive payments for their talent. For example, a writer, if he writes uh, the screenplay, he's gonna get uh, passive payments on the sequel and the prequel and et cetera. And these numbers are all based on Hollywood English language uh, films. So when you start looking at making a remake, you have to factor in all these passive payments. And when you look at the Indian market, those budgets are maybe 10 to 30% of Hollywood budgets. Those numbers just don't make sense for a rights buy. So you're, you're really trying to kind of make this rights deal work for the Indian market, but it just doesn't work economically. So there's a lot of rights we looked at that it just wasn't feasible from that perspective, even though the creative made an excellent remake. And Yasu, what about, I mean, you're controlling or facilitating a lot of IP trying to move here, but how are you pitching it? How are you preparing it for the potential buyers, the potential licensees? I mean, I imagine it's a heck of a lot more than just, you know, mm -hmm. here's a one sheet or here's, a, you know, throwing a comic book or a manga edition on somebody's desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to add the one more difficulty in the U.S., how to sell the IPs to the U.S. company. Um, so we, you know, started this, you know, Los Angeles company, you know, five years ago, but we were nobody. Nobody knows um, who the Amuse is. You know, we have some presence in Japan, but nobody knows the Amuse. So first thing we had to do is to build up the credibility. Nobody taking the meeting, nobody, you know, uh, because, you know, we are, uh, like, we are not presenting, like, a popular title, more like, you know, because Japan has a lot of, you know, uh, interactive property, like from TV, feature film, uh, the manga, animation. So, but, you know, we found out that there is a certain market, you know, who, you know, uh, there are the, you know, there's some, like a certain, you know, studio networks looking for the great concept, even that is an unknown property. So, uh, but, you know, um, it's, it's, it's pitching those, you know, unknown property, it's very hard because nobody knows the property yet. So, um, we are matching up those IP and Hollywood producer. Uh, that is an important process too. But our focus is on more uh, preparation and also the follow up. And also, um, also uh, we are uh, concentrate on the making the good partnership with the U.S. company. Like one of the good example is, you know, we have the Paradigm Talent Agency right now, uh, who help us to set up the meeting and pitching the IP along with our activities. So that is something as a Japanese company because we are Japanese, we are Japanese company. We are, we've been challenger forever in the U.S. market. So how we can penetrate the you know, U.S. market, I think you know, we have to form a strong team in the U.S. Doug, do you think it's easier to adapt an original IP um, literary material, or do you think it's easier to adapt something that's actually already been made, where you're remaking a film? Because I know you've done some interesting remakes in the Japanese market. Which do you, are they easier or just different? You, you'll love my answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right? But everything in life, everything in life depends. Um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of like this, the discussion we had over lunch, um, talking about the movie that, that we presented at the film festival over the weekend, A Bento Harassment. Right, so it's about uh, a, a single mother who can't uh, talk with her daughter, so she makes obento, the Japanese obento, and she, on, on top of the obento, she writes a message every day for a couple of years, and, and that's how they communicate. So, you know, Yasu actually mentioned that, you know, is, is it difficult or it's interesting because, you know, obento is a very Japanese thing, but the, the American audience seemed to, to take to, to the story and how, how the mother and the daughter communicated. But then we took a step back and we thought, you know what, it's just a very, it's kind of a very simple story. 17-year-old daughter, rebellious, single mother, struggling to, to get a million things done at the same time, they have trouble communicating. So even though you, you could argue the concept of obento is difficult for American audiences to understand, the overall concept is actually quite easy. So I think in that aspect, it depends, and it, in that case, it works. In another case, I also mentioned to you uh, Whitesnake, that, um, that um, animation from, from China that I think Warner co-produced or co-financed. For me, I watched it, and I thought the animation was, was incredible, but the, the, the actual Chinese uh, story that it was based on, I could not follow. I did not, I did not understand it. And you know, I, I watched it, I, I thought it was very well done, but I didn't, I didn't feel, I didn't get a, a good sense of understanding the story because I didn't know it. So I, it really does, at least for me, depend. Got it. 
Uh, to jump in though, I mean, what Doug is saying, I think he touched upon a very important sort of topic because when we do remakes, a lot of people think, or at least when we're talking with writers and directors and whatnot, there's this common consensus that we feel that we have to sort of restructure the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? They always say like, oh, for the American market, the American audiences won't understand this or not. But if you really think about it, there's a reason why that Korean movie or those original IPs worked so well globally because they were able to understand mm -hmm. generally, right, um, what that story was about. So as we were doing remakes early on, we had a really difficult time because a lot of the writers, and I don't blame them because they're creative people, right? So creative people want to have their sort of signature on the movie and whatnot. So they tend to take away what we think are essential mm -hmm. to its, the success of the original movie, and they try to change it a lot. Now, we try to work with writers to keep as much as possible, right? And obviously, there will be slight changes, maybe changing the bento box to a paper bag lunch or whatnot. But you know, aside from that, it's trying to change as less as possible, mm -hmm. I feel like is, I mean, as you said, it depends, but that's definitely like, a good example is we have a movie called Miss Granny, and that movie was released in Korea in 2013, and we've made around seven different remakes of that movie globally, and we have about four more coming out. And if you look at, and all of them have been very successful in their respective territories. We had a Chinese remake, Indonesian remake, Thai remake, Vietnamese remake. It is, it's almost frame by frame remake but it's just with local actors, local director, and that's why it did so well, right? Mm. But if we took this to the US and we're remaking that right now, we're having so many fights with the writers in terms of how we gotta, you know, crumble this down and then make it into an American movie and it's just, you know, and I think so, trying to keep it as original as possible is sort of the way to go, mm -hmm. especially for a lot of Francis people. makes a, a really great point because, you know, when you're adapting a property, because there's something about the original that stood out for you. Mm -hmm. And how do you make changes to a story that allow audiences who don't know the property to relate to it, but also not lose the essence of the underlying IP? Then the point is why adapt it? Mm -hmm. And that is that push and pull kind of dynamic. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, certain movies, like if there's a good twist at the end, a lot of the writers would be like, oh, we'll keep that twist but we're gonna change everything else, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a reason why that twist works because everything has built up to that twist, right? And so, you know, twist isn't always the, the most important thing in the original movie. It's everything that has followed up to that. So it's trying to make sure to keep as much as possible from the original um, to make it successful in the respective territories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There have been instances though where directors have actually chosen uh, to do a remake, direct the remake, and it's essentially a shot-by-shot -shot remake of the film that they did in an original language. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that idea? That, I mean, seems a little strange. It's yes, interesting. You, go ahead. If, uh, is it, so we're, we're remaking Your Name, an animation title that did very well in Japan for us. Um, and it's, it's an interesting question about what, what are our challenges here, remaking. And I, I think we're veering exactly to the sort of the opposite of sorts to say, why keep it so original to, to, to the animation? Let's you know, make it something so that it is an adaptation, so that there was a meaning behind you know, going for the global market. And I think it's always a debate of what, what's right. And so it's, mm. it's, it's difficult. Um, your name has a, quite a lot of different aspects, but one of them being it's very, very Shinto. It has the, the main character protagonist is, has a lot of elements to it where um, it gives her the special powers that makes her um, travel in time and body swap. I hope I'm not ruining the story <laughs> for anyone, but I hope, I hope you guys know the title. But, um, and then so the body switching and the time travel will be essentially the part that'll, um, th that's going to keep the title intact, but how do we remake it for the global market? And it's almost a producer's sort of hopes that to see it made into something a little bit different. And so I think it really does depend on the, the property. Once again, it's not really an answer anywhere, but yeah. Yeah, and, and if it is a really well-known property, kind of going to the question posed to Doug, um, there are, the fans also have expectations. <laughs> mm. And so how do you also you know, make sure that the fans embrace it, <laughs> even if it's a different experience? When you have like a movie like Batman, and even though people hate it, they still go. So you have a problem. With that. 
but you know, one of the other movies we had uh, that actually closed our film festival was called Bucket List. And it's, mm. it's you know, based on the Rob Reiner, Jack, Jack Nicholson, Morgan Freeman movie. And Warner redid it in Japan with uh, Sayuri Yoshinaga and Yuki Amami. Mm -hmm. And my favorite answer, it depends. It depended on the scene. So some of the scenes were you know, very um, pure to the original version, particularly when the, the two ladies skydive. It was almost exactly the same as the one where uh, Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson skydive. And then it'll go to another scene that's very, very Japanese. Mm -hmm. So it was almost a scene by scene, um, you know, again, the favorite phrase, it depends on, on what was adapted closely to the US version and what was changed for the market. Right. I mean, Rob, picking up on your point, I know you, were, you, you talk about adapting something and there's an existing fan base. Mm -hmm. I know you were involved in an interesting project called Monster Hunter, mm -hmm. which actually comes from a Japanese <laughs> game, mm -hmm. a well-known Japanese gaming company. Yeah. So there is that built-in fan base when you have the game. Yep. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Sure, and uh, you know, our partners, our good friends at, at Toho and also Constantine, you know, this is actually a very unique partnership. Of course, Steve, you were in the deal as well. <laughs> uh, uh, and you know, it's interesting that you know, a Chinese, Japanese, German company came together uh, to adapt this game property that for our company, you know, we, were, uh, you know, we know very well. And you know all these kind of questions that are being asked today are the things that we all went through together. You know, how do you uh, take a story, you know, like uh, Monster Hunter that is known to to players, but for the large audience, you know, people may not know what creative choices do we need to make? And of course, our uh, the director and writer, you know, has uh, some success adapting games, uh, you know, uh, Resident Evil franchise. So there's been a lot of consideration, even budget, wh where does that you know, fit, but also figuring out what is the core audience, I mean, what's the core market, the, the primary market, uh, because sometimes you have to make the decision, is this meant for one market versus another, and the creative decisions uh, you know, kind of come from that. And I'm sure Yushiko have you know, thoughts on it as well. It's, it's turning out to be a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> that well, I'll say. That's, that's, that's good to hear, but... I mean, Yoshiko, you could also talk a little bit about the process of actually bringing together Toho, Tencent, Constantine, Sony as a distributor. I mean, that, that obviously had its challenges. Uh, Toho sort of came uh, when everything was sort of put together. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure because we weren't, for this property in specific, we weren't the ones that was working for... Um, uh, Capcom, so they were already in discussion with Constantine, and so I, I believe Constantine, I, we shouldn't, Toho shouldn't take any of this credit because Constantine was yeah. probably the ones that was doing most of the yes. work, yes. Right. Definitely. So another question, technology obviously in many ways is disruptive and has been changing the game, but probably for remakes, for adaptations, maybe making things easier in the sense that you can use CGI, you can use certain technological tools to replace settings or to enhance characters? Do you think technology is actually making things more adaptable? <laughs> I think in terms of, I mean, for aside from the actual like movie making, I think in terms of business deal making, so Netflix, the streaming platforms that have come up, um, that have disrupted the market for us, um, we've, we've come to realize, like in our business right now, we have two tiers. We have, the, we have English language original movies that we do, and then we also have the remakes. On the remakes, on the original side of things, we try to target movies, English language movies, with the, that has the potential to also do well in our territories. Because as a distributor in our territories, it's key that these English language movies perform well in our territories, both from a creative standpoint, but also from a business standpoint, there are gonna be movies where we can recoup the budget from our territories alone, if, even if it doesn't get a proper, I mean, Snowpiercer is a good example where initially it was supposed to be a very wide release with the Weinstein Company, it didn't, and it had a falling out, but we were able to, we didn't lose money because as a distributor in our territories, the movie did so well, right? And so those are the originals. On the remake side of things, it's gotten better for us because we don't really have the intent of releasing the remakes in our territories. The audiences in our territories don't, like Korean remakes don't do well in Korea. Korean people have no intention of watching a remake, right? So if Netflix wants to come in and take the world, please do, right? And so it's gotten better for us, whereas in the past, like we try to retain rights um, and we sell it off to a distributor, the traditional studios, but for, with the Netflix and the Amazons coming in, it's just 
gave us more opportunity, more buyers to really sell our remake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Yasu, with your business, do you think that that's changing in terms of episodic format versus feature format? Mm -hmm. Is it becoming more popular, <clears throat> actually, to try and do it with episodic format? Yeah, three, four years ago, you know, we were handling both, like, you know, adaptation for the feature film and TV series. Now, you know, TV, you know, demand from the TV studio is huge. So most likely, we are collecting the IP from the TV network in these days, you know, for the scripted and also the unscripted. Um, it's, you know, we, you know, we been closed uh, some studio deal with Sony Lionsgate and one project on Quibi. Um, th those people, because, because, um, it's almost like a 500 you know, TV series produced last year. And they are looking for the great IP, especially um, agency. And agency doesn't have a writer right now, don't have a writer right now. I think that instead of having, attaching the writer to the project, they're seeing the value on the existing IPs. And whenever we pitch the IPs to the people, we bring the material. Like I'm talking about the you know, great trailers, you know, and we used to handle some uh, like paper material, meaning like a manga or novel, and uh, as an idea for the TV series. But it's hard to convince the people, like a producer here, to read the actual manga or novel. So <laughs> we read it all. Read it all. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, it's 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 great concept, you know, great ideas, you know, uh, the, you know, the, we we can find, you know, in in Japan market, but it's harder to convince those people to read it. So, our focus in this day is bringing like motion pictures, like either feature film or TV series, and make the great trailers uh, for the U.S. market and the pitching with that, you know, trailers. I think that is one of the you know key to you know make the successful pitching. Did I answer to your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it de yes, that definitely answers the question. So, and, and a question for you, Rob or Francis, in terms of exporting it, are, do you have the luxury of sort of doing some internal development beforehand? Mm -hmm. So you're packaging things beforehand, just to Yasu's point, before you go out and you're really trying to pitch something, whether it's to the studios, to this market, are you taking the time to mm. either package it, you know, write some beats, write a Bible, et cetera? I'll jump in first. For, for us, you know, it's early days with Chinese IP. And so it's, um, it's important that we have a creative partner whose strength is identifying the building blocks of a story. Uh, in the case of one of our comic book properties that we're adapting, and, and it's, it's huge in China, but again, internationally, it's not known. And so in this case, uh, we found uh, a partner in Channing Tatum and his company, Free Association. Um, it's an action comedy, kind of genre bending, and uh, immediately they understood the DNA of it. So you know, we want to make informed decisions. So in that case, we wanted to work with them to figure out what is the, the right take of the story that could work internationally. Who's the writer? That makes sense. So for, for our company, um, we, we really um, look to establish early creative partners who we can work together to figure out the best direction. Um, I'm not sure, Francis, your process is a bit you know, different, but that's how we're right now approaching it. And we're just taking a little bit more of a uh, maybe curated approach. Um, Adaptation is difficult no matter what, um, so we want to make sure that we're really focused on you know, making the right progress. For us, I think it's, um, there's definitely an evolution. As I said, we've been doing this for 10, 12 years, so in the beginning, we were the most passive IP owners ever. We're just sitting on top of these IP, waiting for people to come, right? And we're waiting, we're just sitting in front of our computers, waiting for that email to come in, right? I want that IP, right? Um, the next step was, taking the IP ourselves, not knowing what will work, but taking as much IP as possible and taking a slightly more proactive role in meeting everybody in the industry, right? Now it's come to a point where we identify what's gonna work and we try to identify also when it's a good time to go. And also we, we have a certain template that we create in which we try to go out to the partners with a firm, of, firm idea in terms of how we think this should be remade. 
So um, in terms of timeline, a good example is um, we sold a movie earlier this year to Universal called Extreme Job. And this was Korea's number one movie of all time. Did well. A lot of people don't know this, but we partnered up with Kevin Hart to go to Universal. We actually approached and partnered up with Kevin Hart a few weeks after the Korean movie was greenlit in Korea. So even before the Korean movie got into production, we knew right after Greenlight that this movie would do well in the US and Kevin Hart would be the perfect partner. So we had created, a mater we had created materials in terms of how we envisioned this for the US. We went to Kevin Hart and we had partnered up with Kevin Hart by the time the Korean movie was going into production. Mm -hmm. And then by the time the movie was over and it got its release, we had already partnered up with Universal mm -hmm. by then. So the reason why we did that is because one, we wanted to shorten the gap between the long chain of title processes and having to wait and see, you know, certain movies, a lot of studios want to see how it performs in certain territories, but Extreme Job was one of those things where just the log line itself, everybody would go after. But it was one of those movies where it did need a strong cast. And if you've seen the movie, everybody agrees that Kevin Hart is the perfect person to play that movie, to lead that movie. And so we were able to identify. So uh, going back to your question, it's evolved. We were the person sitting in front of the computer waiting for those love calls. Now we're in the position where we're leading um, the process of creating our own material and being very firm in terms of how creatively how this movie should be made in the US. Mm -hmm. So a question just for the group. Along the way, because you've all had these different journeys with different IPs, what, is, what surprises have you encountered? What is it that you didn't expect that happened on your journey and you were like, I didn't see that coming? I would love to jump in there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I don't know if everyone knows the history of Bollywood, but Bollywood has been predominantly based off of uh, Indian producers uh, going to the US, picking up a bunch of DVDs, flying back, telling writers to illegally remake these scripts <laughs> and shooting it either frame by frame or exact same stories <laughs> and ripping off movies illegally. So <clears throat> about six years ago, we came about this idea to you know, uh, help the studios monetize their rights and do official remake rights deals. And this is where most Indian producers didn't believe in the model and they just said, we'll change it enough so we don't need the rights. So anyway, so when we bought the rights to remake Rambo, um, I was surprised that um, I, myself, as a producer and my partners, would have to uh, go after and sue two other Indian producers who were trying to illegally remake Rambo when I had just bought the rights and announced the deal. So that's quite surprising. I don't know if anyone else has gotten into that unique of a scenario. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, yeah. Actually, something similar happened to one of my Chinese clients that bought the format rights to The Voice. But that's a whole long story. <laughs> There you go. Doug, it looked like you were going to say something. On... Oh, I, I, well, the, the, I think the most surprising thing to me is that the phrase in entertainment, nobody knows, is still valid in 2019, because you never know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, make, you, you do all this work that we've been talking about, you put something together, you throw it out there, maybe they buy, maybe they don't. You mm -hmm. never know. Mm -hmm. Well, but some things, I mean, some iconic things, for example, Godzilla, coming back to that, it's in the minds of so many different fans of so many different generations. Um, so yes, there's pressure in terms of how you're gonna present it, but on the other hand, I think you can have a certain confidence. Maybe there's no formula, but a confidence that- I think so you, you, have a, you have a confidence, but you know, what, what counts is the incremental, right? So you, if you're talking about the incremental, you never know. Uh, the confidence, yeah, I mean, if we make, if we make a movie, whether it's Batman or, or now we have some history with Godzilla, we have a pretty good idea of what, what that thing's gonna do in the box. But the other you know, incremental things, those things still can be rather mm -hmm. uncertain. Mm -hmm. Francis, Rob, what, what kind of surprises have you encountered? I think for us, um, we're discovering that audiences are actually more open to seeing stories from different cultures. Um, and that, you know, I think that it's, I think we've seen some bright spots uh, with films that were so distinct in another language and, and other audiences from around the world have really connected with it. Uh, and I think sometimes in the, you know, kind of rush to try to make it really global, but sometimes you lose that local sense of feeling so that this, the world feels more distinct. And I think that's been surprising. Rather good surprise, probably. Yep. 
I don't have that many surprises. You don't have that many. <laughs> Everything just goes according to plan for no, you. No, 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 that definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> that's, that's not the case. But I mean, it, it's, you know, we're in this industry where we're, we know that there are going to be surprises around the corner. So I yeah. think like, um, I think one of the, when we were first doing this, I think we were surprised at how much the studios, because obviously there are holdbacks that they always want to put in place, right? Mm -hmm. And how we want to continue exploiting our property. Um, globally, but there are all these holdbacks. And I'm just always surprised at how much the studios especially care about how these movies perform or how, how these movies will be exploited in territories that are very, very, very small. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, right. really, you care about that territory? Like, you need to put a seven-year holdback <laughs> <laughs> because you think our movie in that country is going to, you know, cannibalize the American movie. It's like, those are the, th but I think the studios are becoming a lot more flexible too. Um, and I think that's a good sign. They're understanding that as more Asian companies here are making profit, I think we can all agree 10, 15 years ago, we were never in the position of creating remakes as an active producer or financier, mm -hmm. right? We were literally IP sellers, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had to follow the Hollywood rule. But now as Asia is getting bigger and as our companies are getting bigger locally and as, as we're taking more active roles in the US, the studios are also becoming more flexible and understanding how important our business is in our, yeah. in our territories. I think that's a good sign. And I would just touch on that. I think that's been a really important um, aspect of how we engage in our business. It's really partnerships. Um, you know, how can we, because we're all playing very active roles and, you know, I think we all bring something, you know, unique um, uh, to a partnership. And so that really is a driving force for us is, you know, is this a truly a win-win scenario? And if that's the case, both creatively and the business, I think, you know, you, you find a more clear path uh, to the finish line. Yeah, so you're finding the same thing that you're seeing greater flexibility from mm -hmm. studio buyers, studio licensees. Right. Um, so I think, you know, for example, like a legal terms, for example, um, it's, it, we're talking about the holdback reversion and also the reserved rights. And the, the Jap Japanese company and the studio are talking about the same thing, but term is different. And also the, between Japan and the U.S., they have a difference of the nature of role and also the business custom, the difference. Mm. And the Japanese company were afraid of because Hollywood studio taking the hundred percent, you know, everything they are taking the everything. But right now, like you know, Francis said, I see we seen a lot of flexibilities. You know, they have a good ear to listen to what the original creator said, what the original uh, IP holder said. So that is a good surprise. Mm -hmm. I add. Mm -hmm. Got it. And Doug, your view is: do you do you feel that philosophically, internally, that the studio's views are changing? That this flexibility has come from a conscious decision, realizing that things are being done differently elsewhere and that you kind of have to adapt? Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, Warner Brothers has had local production um, and probably gets more money out of local production than any other you know, major Hollywood studio by far. You know, I think we've been very um, proactive in, in, again, like I mentioned, you know, bucket list and taking that U.S. property to Japan and doing that, but also the reverse, taking, you know, Japanese movies and, and making them here, whether it's partnerships with Toho or whoever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think our company would like to look at ourselves as, as global, not necessarily American. And that we, we, you know, quite frankly, we want to get as much out of, out of the pie as we can. And we, we will be flexible in order to do that. Yeah. So, DJ, I hope you at least won your lawsuits. <laughs> yeah, both very interesting stories. That's uh, going to take a, a whole other panel of time to talk about. <laughs> So with that, with the little bit of time we have left, I thought we'd open it up for questions to the audience. So if anyone has any questions for our panelists, we have one right there. You guys talked a lot about remakes with IP. I'm very curious how about, just to know a little bit more about your experience with co-productions and whether you think there's much of a future with them. Anybody want to take on the subject of co-production? Well, I mean, like I, I briefly mentioned how we're doing a lot of originals as well, right? And we, we're here not to compete with all of the major production companies here. We're not here to chase after all the same IP. We want to create a very distinct uh, brand within Hollywood. So 
as I mentioned earlier, our brand is we want to focus on English language movies where U.S. is obviously the primary market, but where it can do well globally, but also particularly in our territories. And I think from uh, when I was mentioning this earlier, from a business standpoint, it makes sense. From a creative standpoint, it's also so that, because everybody wants to understand Asia now, right? And so when they, if we create that distinct brand and we continue on that path, we're going to be the ones that are the experts in terms of these are the English language movies that do well in our territory. So four or five years ago when we started this, we started identifying what works in Korea or Asia as a whole, but particularly Korea. And we started realizing music genre movies do exceptionally well in Korea. Um, everybody here has probably watched Begin Again, but Begin Again did 16 million in the U.S., but it did 25 million in Korea. Everybody in Korea has seen Sing Street. No one in the U.S. has seen Sing Street. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody, Korea was the third market in the world, right? So all of these musicals and music genre movies do well. So that's where I just came from. In Hawaii, we're shooting a music genre romance movie, right? We also realized that horror uh, movies do really well um, in Korea. So we've created a separate label called 413 Pictures that focuses on horror genre movies. <laughs> So that's sort of how we're approaching co-production, not just going in to do you know, a lot of the big like temple movies or anything like that, but we try to want to, we, we're trying to create a unique image and brand here in Hollywood to say, look, we're here to do English language movies, we're serious, but we're also confident that these movies will do well in our territories. Love to jump in there also. I mean, uh, I'm based in Beijing, China with uh, our company, and obviously we have a lot of different deals around the world, including India. And um, I helped put together as executive producer the first China-India co-production, which was called Kung Fu Yoga with Jackie Chan. Um, and our goal in terms of putting that film together was never meant to be uh, a 50-50 box office film between both markets. We looked at the co-production as a way of sharing cultures between both countries. And ultimately, at that point in time, China and India, the two biggest uh, populations in the world, didn't really know much about each other. So. Ultimately, the governments of both countries made it a priority to start doing films between, between both countries with the use of soft power to kind of really get uh, uh, the population's understanding tourism, business, uh, locations, talent, stories uh, across both countries. And so when we put that film together, uh, we really looked at it as, you know, we're looking at aiming a film for the China market, but sharing some Indian culture, story, talent that would be in, an interesting um, uh, approach for Chinese audiences to see and experience uh, a new world. I think we have time for one last question um, right there. Um, yeah, my name is Athena, and I'm curious because you guys obviously have to do a lot of co productions, how you go about sourcing writers for this? I'm not a writer, I'm just curious, because obviously <laughs> obviously, that is one of the biggest challenges, right? Like, good writers are not necessarily good adapters mm -hmm. sometimes, but uh, yeah, I'm curious how you go about that in finding the right person for a given project. I mean, I can speak to you know, some of our projects. It's actually pretty straightforward. It's not that different <laughs> than um, just a pure U.S. production. You're um, you know, you're, you're canvassing, um, you know, if it's here, you know, the agency is certainly and, and to see what ideas come up, but also, you know, really to see um, also culturally how open they are. Um, and, and because, you know, if it's in, in our case, a Chinese IP, you have to be able to look past some of the aspects of the story that, of course, is inherently Chinese because it's set there. Um, and so it's finding writers who have that ability to, to you know, to look past that. Uh, and to identify, you know, what makes it a unique story. So, you know, we we also are looking for those writers who are also very collaborative in the process. Uh, some are, some have their process where they need to kind of go away, write and come back. Um, but I think for us, because there is, um, you know, this is based on a property that uh, we want to ensure that it's the right version, that it's a more active, hands-on kind of collaboration. So. You know, for us, that's kind of how we've been approaching it. I think to add to that also, I mean, uh, we've executive produced two China co-productions now, and we've uh, organically developed the scripts for the China market. And I think that there's a lot of producers that think it's just easy changing burgers to dumplings, and all of a sudden it's, you know, adapted for China. That's not the case. And, 
you know, over the last several years of living in Beijing, we've been searching for different scripts that could be co-productions or adapted for China. And, you know, it's probably 99% of the stuff we've read just never worked out organically. So we found a lot of success uh, finding the right writer and really just developing something from scratch, from a concept, from an IP, from et cetera, that uh, really builds in uh, the local market, the sensibilities, the culture. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of nailing that before you start focusing on which direction with the co-production to go. Yeah, and to add one thing, you know, we've been experimenting having a writer here in the U.S., but also a writer, um, a Chinese writer, so that you're getting the cultural perspective right and having um, you know, both sides kind of share their, their perspective on, on um, you know, how to tell that story. So again, it's trying different things um, to make sure that it feels natural and authentic. Uh, to both sides. And that's Those actually a great point because I think that uh, international writers, you know, specifically Hollywood writers, they're excellent in terms of, you know, uh, characters and story and arc um, where, you know, for example, Chinese writers lack some of those skill sets because obviously they haven't had that much experience in terms of the industry. So it, it is almost crucial to team up these writers to work together on a variety of fronts, whether it's uh, uh, culture or structure or story. So um, for the films that we've developed as co-productions, that's always been essential. So look, I know that our time is up and I want to thank everybody for participating. Really, it was great and it was great to have you. So thank you.